Hello and welcome to Probabilistic Machine Learning lecture number 15. In the course so far we've already advanced now quite a bit. We're more than halfway through, already over here, having gone through all of this. And maybe you've noticed a trend emerging. We saw in the very first lecture that probabilistic inference the mechanism created by probability theory allows an extension of propositional logic and therefore the rules of probabilistic reasoning of propositional reasoning beyond statements of discrete truth value by distributing truth over a space of hypotheses and this gives rise to this mechanism called Bayesian inference, which is encoded in this uh, fundamental equation called Bayes' theorem. Now we quickly noticed in lecture two actually already that this process is unfortunately, in general, computationally very hard. And the fundamental reason for that is that if you want to distribute truth over a space of hypotheses, that then means that you now have to keep track of all of these hypotheses when reasoning about even a single one of these hypotheses. You can see this reflected in Bayes' theorem. To make a statement about the truth value of one particular hypothesis under the data, you have to keep track of all of the other explanations because you have to compare to them and sum them out. More generally, this means that integrals, like computations that involve volumes in the, in the weighted um, measured hypothesis space, so the hypothesis space weighted by the probability measure, are at the core operation of probabilistic inference, whether it be to compute evidences in Bayes' theorem or to just make statements, analytic statements, about probability distributions like this posterior. For example, you might want to know where most of the mass of this distribution is, how wide the region is where that mass is located, where the center of the mass of this probability mass is. And for these kind of operations, you need to compute, for example, moments or more generally expected values of general functions, and this, in general, can be very hard. So, the practical process of probabilistic reasoning, what we're trying to achieve in this entire course, is fundamentally a computational task. And so what you have been, well, what I've tried to lay out in front of you in the past few lectures is a collection of tools to simplify or at least make tractable this process. For example, we saw that conditional independence as reflected in the graphical view of graphical models can help drastically simplify computations because if you know that one part of your inference process becomes independent of other parts when conditioned on certain variables, you can use this to separate the process into, into, into individual steps. We also saw that sampling methods find, um, represent a way to turn non-finite, so continuous integrals, into discrete operations. It might still be hard, but at least they are tractably hard. We then encountered, and this became a theme for a large part of the lecture, the wonderful framework of Gaussian distributions which have an intricate connection to linear algebra in the sense that if you're, if you're reasoning about a set of variables that are connected to each other by linear operations and the joint distribution over these variables is Gaussian, then all the operations we need for probabilistic inference, marginals, conditionals, and so on, are Gaussian distributions and, can, and their parameters can be computed in linear algebra. And that we use this insight to build actually a very powerful framework for, machine, for large parts of machine learning already, essentially more or less any form of supervised machine learning. We first saw that we can learn, we can use the Gaussian framework to learn functions that are described in a parametric finite dimensional way with features. We then saw that we can learn these features using a process that is connected to what we now call deep learning by maximizing likelihoods. There is another 
maybe equally exciting framework which allows us not to use a hierarchical deep structure of features but to extend towards the limit of infinitely many, infinitely wide neural networks if you like called kernel machines and this gave rise to the concept of a Gaussian process. We saw how powerful this framework is, that it can be adapted to certain settings. For example, that it allows particularly fast inference if the data has an input time structure. And we also saw that we can extend this framework even to the setting where the function we're trying to learn does not have real valued output. So if it's discrete, if it's a classification problem or has other kind of structure, then maybe we might be willing to just sort of squeeze it a little bit and um, suspend this belief to some degree and approximate the associated non-Gaussian distributions using the Laplace approximation. So basically to turn something that isn't actually Gaussian into a Gaussian by just pretending that we want to have a Gaussian and using a particular way to find, to construct such an approximate Gaussian. What I want to do today is to maybe open the final third of this lecture by breaking with the Gaussian framework or in other words trying to see where we can go if we deliberately leave the Gaussian framework behind and see what happens if we go beyond Gaussian distributions. The first time we encounter the situation in our modeling so far in which we had to give up Gaussian distributions was in the setting of Gaussian process regression when we wanted to learn representations for regression models which actually used Gaussian distributions. You remember that we were trying to learn general linear functions which map from an input domain over x in a nonlinear fashion to y by representing the nonlinear function through a bunch of features that are weighted in a linear fashion with some weights and um, th that can easily be done with Gaussian distributions. That's the whole main power of the Gaussian framework. But then if we ask ourselves what the right features are to use to represent this function, we encounter the problem that to learn that the, the corresponding likelihood, which happens to be a marginal distribution over this uh, joint model, um, is not a linear in general Gaussian type distribution. That means it's not a Gaussian distribution that contains the quantity we care about, in this case labeled as theta, as a linear map in its mean or um, argument. And so to learn this parameter theta, what we did so far is we basically jettisoned the probabilistic framework, we gave up on probabilistic reasoning and said, well, okay, we don't know how to do this, so we throw, out, throw up our hands and just compute the likelihood itself, or maybe a posterior, uh, and uh, by multiplying or adding, in this case, in the log space, a prior, and then just find the minimum of this negative log posterior, which is the maximum of the posterior, to get a point estimate. So, of course, this is, in some sense, disappointing because it's really not probabilistic anymore. It doesn't provide uncertainty over these variables theta and it doesn't allow us to integrate out an entire space of hypotheses over what theta might be. Back then, when this situation arose in the lecture, I just presented this situation as fact. I just said, well, at this, case, at this point, we don't know anymore how to do probabilistic inference, so let's just, just throw it out and use point estimation. That was a good decision back then because it allowed us to continue on quickly. But maybe now that we have a little bit more time and we've seen what we can do with this powerful framework, maybe we can look at this again and um, wonder something that some of you may already have wondered back then, which is, well, do we really have to be so quick in, and, and so radical in our abandonment of probabilistic inference? Really, what is it in, these, in this situation that makes this inference intractable? Like then I just assumed that there is a general feature function here and so therefore we really don't know what the shape of this thing is so we don't know anything about it. Well, let's just forget about it. But there, of course there are situations in which you can actually learn these parameters in closed form. For the Gaussian framework we've used so far for regression, is 
actually a particular example of such a situation. So another way of phrasing the key property that we've been using for regression using the Gaussian framework is that if you get observations from a Gaussian distribution for which you just don't know what the mean is, so you draw a bunch of samples that all come from a Gaussian with, an, with a known noise covariance but an unknown mean, then this is essentially the same as our situation in regression where we get to see a linear map of, but other than that it's the same thing, of an unknown function which I now just call mu which happens to be a scalar in this little plot and we just get observations of that function at various points. Now what we've done in regression so far essentially is that we've observed, we noticed that if we choose a prior on this unknown parameter mu which is itself Gaussian, so it itself is a Gaussian distribution with a mean and a covariance but another mean and a covariance then posterior inference is actually possible in closed form because the product of a Gaussian prior and a Gaussian likelihood is another Gaussian and it happens to have parameters that have this complicated shape. So that means if we observe samples from a Gaussian distribution, several of them, then we can include them in the posterior in an analytic fashion and we just always get back a Gaussian distribution. So is this situation unique? Is this the only case ever in which we can do closed form analytic inference on a variable in our model or a set of variables in our model? Well actually no. So earlier on in the course, in lecture 3, before we even encountered Gaussian distributions, we already saw a situation that is conceptually quite similar and it's connected to the example or I mean you encountered it in the example I did on what's the proportion of people in the population that are wearing glasses. So that's inference on an unknown variable which you might call f which is a probability so it's a number between 0 and 1 and we get observations that are draws with that probability so coin tosses if you like random variables that are either 0 or 1 and are drawn with probability f. Then if you get n such throws then um, the probability for them individually to fall on one or the other class is given by this expression which we can simplify by introducing variables um, n0 and n1 for the number of uh, such observations. So for example observing n1 people that are wearing glasses and n0 people which are not wearing glasses. We saw back then that if we choose as a prior over this unknown variable f a probability distribution which we actually call the beta distribution which is of the same form in some sense as this likelihood so it also contains terms f to some parameter and 1 minus f to some parameter and it seemed convenient to introduce the parameter minus 1 here then the posterior distribution over this unknown variable f will be tractable in the sense that the posterior is of the same form as the likelihood so it's uh, so so the uh, number of observations just needs to be added in the exponent here so we take the prior and we just add the numbers n1 and n0 in the expression and then the only challenge in this which is actually present in um, I mean yeah this framework in general is that we need to compute the normalization constant of this distribution. Now Laplace actually couldn't do this integral, it's called the beta integral, we had to wait for Euler to sort it out but notice that this is really the only challenge here. So if you know how to approximate this integral then we can do closed form inference. Now, Laplace actually approximated this integral using a Gaussian approximation Today we don't have to do that anymore because we have computers to do that for us. So if we have a way to compute this integral then we have a closed form inference process here on an unknown variable which isn't Gaussian distributed at all. It's a number between 0 and 1. And you saw back then that these distributions don't look anything like Gaussian distributions. I mentioned back then that this concept of finding such a prior distribution that in this sense sort of fits the likelihood, is amenable to the likelihood which means that the posterior distribution 
arising from this likelihood under this prior actually is of the same analytic or uh, sort of structural form as the prior is called a conjugate prior situation. So this kind of prior is called conjugate to this likelihood because the posterior is of the same form as the prior. Now it turns out that this is actually not the only case in which such conjugate priors exist. Well, the Gaussian inference framework we just looked at is another situation where we make observations with some likelihood and we have found a prior such that when we multiply the prior with the likelihood, the posterior looks like the prior. Now here it just happened to be the case that the prior and the likelihood were actually of the same shape. They were, they were both Gaussian. Here, arguably, this is not the case because um, these two distributions are in some sense different. I mean, they look conceptually quite similar, but notice that this is a distribution over x and this is a distribution over f. So as a function of f, this object here looks quite different as this object looks as a function of x, right? So here the, the argument is in the exponent and here the argument is, uh, well, not at the exponent. It actually turns out that there is a generalization of this concept from the binary case where we observe members of two classes, in or out, to the multi-class case, which is due to this person called Peter Gustav Lejean Dirichlet. Uh, well, he's probably best described as a Western European mathematician of the late age of, age of enlightenment. He was born in a small town called Düren, which uh, lies between Aachen and Cologne. And um, back then was actually French. His father, and that's the story behind his name, came from a small town to the north in Belgium. Actually, not his father, sorry, his grandfather came from a small town to the north uh, in Belgium called Richelieu. Uh, so he was the young of the family from Richelieu, the Le Jean de Richelieu. And he became uh, one of the great mathematicians of the 19th century. He was a contemporary of Humboldt and Gauss and uh, Poisson and Fourier and many other great mathematicians. He actually married a sister of Felix Mendelssohn Bartholdi, so he must have lived in really uh, sort of enlightened society. And he made many great contributions to mathematics that go way beyond this simple kind of observation that we're going to do now. But this one seems to at least be tr um, due to him, and which is the observation that we can think about the situation we just had in the beta distribution for the binary case, in the more general case that there are um, k possible um, instances of observation. So for example, um, you could imagine that society consists of several different groups or several different, every, every person can have one of K features in some observation. Um, so for example, we could think about who is wearing glasses, who is wearing contact lenses and who is not wearing them. Now we already have three. And um, if we make such observations, each with probability F K, if you like, or F X, right? So where X goes from, um, well, zero to k or from, from one plus two to, to k, then, um, and we make n such observations, then there is a similar kind of situation here that every single observation comes with a certain probability. So if we make n k observations of the individual classes each, so we make, um, let's say, three observations of the first class and five observations of the second class and so on, then this function can be rewritten, rewritten in this form. So now there are not n terms in here anymore, but only k, which of course is convenient because it sort of summarizes the process from an unbounded number of data points into a finite number of classes. And of course, we can think of a corresponding prior distribution that is conjugate to this expression. And the argument is extremely similar to the one on the previous slide, so I can just show it to you, right? If we choose our prior to be a distribution that is in its sort of business end has a product over individual terms f k for each class k raised to some positive power, then the posterior distribution, so p of f given x, is going to be of the same form. It's going to involve Again, a product over the f's case where the a, the alpha case, just get added, or the, so the nk, the observations, just get added to the alpha case. Again, the only trick here is that we need to know what the normalization constant of that distribution is. And that happens to be the, what you might call the multivariate beta 
integral. Um, it's a corresponding version, which you can imagine, right? It's just the integral over this kind of expression over all the fk. And this distribution is called the Dirichlet distribution because of him. So if you have access to this integral, then inference becomes closed form. And we can keep track of uncertainty over a large number of individual probabilities for individual events to occur without having to resort to complicated numerical operations. So now we have two examples of closed form Bayesian inference, the Gaussian one and the, well, in general, the Dirichlet one because the beta inference um, due to uh, Laplace is a special case of the Dirichlet, essentially. You might be wondering, hmm, are those the only two? But we saw sort of a structure here, right? We looked at the likelihood, we looked at the likelihood as a function of the unknown variable, and wondered whether we could construct a prior distribution that um, is conjugate. Right? So let's see if we can do this in a more manual way for a situation that we haven't encountered yet. So let's say we have uh, we can make observations from a Gaussian distribution, but we actually know what the mean is. We just don't know what the variance is. Notice that this is quite different from the situation we had so far. So, so far we assume we know what the noise is, but we don't know what the mean is. We use that to learn functions of x by putting a Gaussian distribution over those functions. That's the corresponding Gaussian prior for the mean and then making observations of them with no noise. And in both cases, we assume that we know the variance. We chose the kernel of our Gaussian process prior and we choose the variance of our likelihood. Now, what happens if we don't know the, the variance, but we do know the mean? Well, maybe we can use this idea of a conjugate prior. And to do so, let's look at the logarithm of this Gaussian likelihood. Because by now you may have noticed that it's actually often convenient to look at the logarithm of probability distributions because then products of prior and likelihoods turn into sums of log priors and log likelihoods and we can look at the terms. So the logarithm of this Gaussian distribution is given by this expression. This is just the Gaussian distribution and then taking the logarithm of it. So here is the sort of what we think of as the business end of the Gaussian distribution, x minus mu squared divided by sigma squared. And the other two is what we think of as the normalization constant. So the square root of two pi in the denominator and the square root of um, the variance. Now, if you look at this as, an exp as a function of the variance though, then this normalization constant actually plays a really non-trivial role because sigma is a part of this normalization constant. So we cannot just forget about it if we want to have a prior over sigma. So if we continue our thought process from the previous few slides and ask, well, what kind of prior would we need that would be conjugate to this expression, then we notice that, hmm, okay, so, we will probably need an expression that involves a logarithm of sigma squared and something that is a function, a rational function, so a function of one over sigma squared. So it turns out that this function exists and it's connected to um, an integral that is famous for various different reasons. It's a very important special function and maybe we can connect it just to add one more name to our um, interesting collection to this Swiss mathematician called Daniel Bernoulli. He's one of the, the two brothers Bernoulli. He, we could also assign it to Euler, but Euler did so much uh, that maybe it's better to assign it to, to Bernoulli. Um, actually, it arose from an exchange of letters between Bernoulli and Euler and Goldbach, actually. So how does that work? So let's say we have a log prior, which is of this form. And by of that form, and this is really the tricky bit here, is we, we think of this function really as a function of sigma. So there will be a term that involves, um, well, the logarithm of sigma inverse or minus the logarithm of sigma squared. So actually, let's think of the variable sigma squared as the variable we really care about. That makes things easier. And um, um, another term that involves one over sigma squared. So actually, we realize maybe we can think of a function of sigma inverse squared. That makes things easier. Um, it's because then we just have that variable here and in the logarithm here. 
And then there's going to be, of course, terms in front of that. So let's just give names to them, alpha and beta. And due to historical reasons, it makes sense to write alpha plus one here. So it turns out that this is itself a probability distribution. It's called the gamma distribution, or this is the logarithm of that distribution. If you take the exponential of it, then we get an expression that looks like this up to normalization. So of course, this isn't itself a probability distribution. To make it a probability distribution, we have to normalize it to make it to integrate to one. And that means we need to know what the normalization constant is, which here I've just called z. So um, that corresponds to, if you take the exponential of it, um, one over the exponential of z. And we need to know what that is. So to do so, we need to take an expression like this and integrate it against sigma inverse square. Now it turns out that that can be done. And how to do that is due to Bernoulli, who found out that, well, first of all, you can maybe imagine that this is sort of a, a function that is of the form x to some power times e to minus x. If there's a parameter beta in here, then we can, change, we can do a change of variable, basically we rescale x, and then that adds this additional term beta to the alpha here, which comes from the change of variable here, as you can probably imagine. And then we can instead do an integral over x to some alpha times e to the minus x. And that happens to be the gamma integral. That's the name for this important function. So if we use this prior, then the posterior distribution given observations from a Gaussian with unknown variance sigma squared is going to be again a gamma distribution. So a distribution of the same form over the inverse variance with a parameter that is given by the, whatever the original parameter of the prior was plus, well, so here we have um, an alpha in front of the sigma inverse, uh, lo the log sigma inverse squared in the observation there will be n such terms, each introducing a term one half times logarithm of sigma squared. So we will get an additional plus n half term in our posterior. And for, the pos for this other parameter, beta, well, we're going to get lots of terms. So beta plays the role of the thing that goes in front of in the logarithm one over sigma squared. So in the likelihood, we'll have n terms that look like this, that come from this form. So what we need to add to our uh, to get our, to our posterior to beta is the term one half times the sum over these individual terms. And that gives us a way to learn the variance of a Gaussian over time. Interesting. So now we know how to learn the mean of a Gaussian. We've already been doing that for a long time now. And also now we know how to learn the variance of a Gaussian if we know the mean. What do we do if we don't know either the mean or the variance? Well, here I'm going to do a quick answer and I'll leave the detailed derivations to you. I might set that as, an, as a homework. So if we have an unknown, if we have observations, x, data, that we get to collect, that come from Gaussian distribution, or from a single Gaussian distribution drawn IID with unknown mean and unknown variance, then we can essentially, and I'll just tell you that that's the case, do this, the analogous kind of step to what I just did on this slide. You take the logarithm, you look at this expression as this likelihood as an, uh, an, a function of the unknown variables. So here the unknown variables are mu and sigma and then concoct a collection a, a, a function for the prior where the functional forms of the prior are dictated by the shape of this likelihood. And then what we are left to do is to just rearrange this expression until we can figure out how to compute the integral over this expression over the unknown variables, over mu and sigma. And that turns out to be a product, this conjugate prior, of a Gaussian given sigma with new parameters mean and this sort of scale on the variance called nu. And then a distribution over sigma inverse that is a gamma distribution with two parameters which we just saw. If you do so then the posterior distribution given these observations actually is of the same form. It's again that is, this is called a Gauss inverse gamma prior. So if you get more of these observations here you see the shape of this kind of distribution. It's a prior distribution over both mu and sigma and these distributions tend to have this perhaps interesting shape. Now if you make observations that from from this Gaussian from some true value. Here's one that I've chosen. I've actually drawn from this distribution and uh, keep making lots of observations. 
then this distribution will concentrate this posterior and eventually it will concentrate around the true value actually. This is a famous setting as you can imagine because it's sort of the, the elementary form of scientific inference on a generative process with uh, unknown measurement noise and unknown value of an unknown variable. So sigma is the measurement noise and mu is the variable. It's connected with the name of William Seeley Gossett who wrote this paper under a pseudonym called Student and maybe you'll get to do and live through that story yourself in a homework exercise. So what we've just done here is we've seen several different examples of a quite interesting general structure that we'll study for the rest of the lecture and that's called a conjugate prior. A conjugate prior is a probability distribution for, um, called pi over an unknown variable x with, or a random variable x with some parameters theta that is convenient to use in the context of a likelihood given uh, by some probability distribution over some data that is observable given the unknown latent variable x. It's convenient because it has the property that it can be written in some algebraic form which we're going to be talking about now in a moment such that the product of the likelihood with that prior actually has the same algebraic form. So we can write it in the form of pi over probability distribution over x given a bunch of other parameters. Now you can imagine, or maybe just from reading this definition, you notice that this is a relatively weak definition. It doesn't actually say what, by, what we mean by algebraic form. So what we're going to do next is to think of a convenient algebraic form to formalize this process. Before we do so, here's a quick gray slide so you can take a brief break and think about what we've just done so far. Once you've done that, let's return to this question. So in this definition of a conjugate prior, I've really just said a conjugate prior is a probability distribution that makes inference easy. So what exactly do we mean by easy? Well, we mean that this update in the uh, form of the parameters from the prior to the posterior should be easy to do. Well, maybe the easiest operation to do on a computer is addition. So maybe we want our update for theta to be of the form that the posterior's parameter, theta prime, are uh, the prior's parameter plus some update term. That was actually the case in all of the examples so far. Maybe you want to go back and look at the slides to convince yourself that that's actually the case. It turns out that, and this actually requires a little bit of thinking, but thankfully it was done for us by smart people in the past, that there is a, a general form for the probability distribution that we can think about that gives us this kind of update. And this form is called an exponential family. An exponential family is a probability distribution and this is going to be the most, maybe most difficult definition of this lecture, so maybe you want to go slow here, is a probability distribution over an unknown variable x given some parameters w. So here this is another parameterization of our situation in which we want to do inference on x given some data y that is a, a distributed according to a likelihood y given x and we want a prior for x. So that prior for x will have to be a probability distribution over x and it will have itself parameters and that those parameters we'll call w. Such a probability distribution is called an exponential family if it is of this form. So it's given by a function of x times the exponential of an inner product between some function of x and the parameters w minus a function that only depends on w and is conveniently written in this form as minus the logarithm of some function z of w. We can also, of course, rearrange things around here. The h of x could be moved into the exponential. Then we would have exponential of logarithm of h of x minus logarithm of z of w plus this inner product of a function of x and w. Or we could move z out of the exponential and then we have an expression like this. All of these are just the same. The important structure here is that there are uh, parameters w and the uh, variable x and they connect to each other in the sense that there is one term that only depends on x, one term that only depends on w, and a mixing term which is linear in the parameters w, but potentially nonlinear in the parameters phi of x.
These particular functions in uh, this definition have names because they are so important. H of x is called the base measure. W is called the natural parameter of this exponential family or the natural set of parameters. And phi of x is called the sufficient statistics of this distribution over x. Why this is the case, we'll see in a moment. Exponential family distributions simplify the construction of conjugate models. Before I show you how to do that though, let me first maybe briefly convince you that actually all the distributions we've encountered so far over continuous variables and discrete ones are of this exponential, exponential family form or at least can be brought into this form. So let's first consider maybe the most simplest one, the Bernoulli distribution. So that's the distribution over observing, uh, for observing individual events of a coin toss or more generally a certain number of successful experiments, such experiments. So for example, the probability two of a group of people of size n observe k of these people to wear glasses. Then as a function of this number of positive observations k rather than the individual observations, named observations, that distribution needs a, um, a sort of a correction for being a true probability distribution over k. This is this n choose k uh, combinatorial term. So that's the number of instantiations in which we observe k positive cases among a collection of n or sort of re rearrange them in n. Then, um, so this term was not on previous slides because back then there was a distribution over the individual events rather than the counts themselves. So if you want to talk about the counts then you need this additional term. Then uh, that distribution, the Bernoulli distribution, is given by this expression where here that's the important bit that we've seen before and it depends on an unknown variable q. So we can think of q as a parameter of this distribution and then see if we can bring it into an exponential family form. Notice that I'm treating n as a fixed number here which is not a parameter. And you might already, that might already raise some questions for you which we're going to get to in a moment. So if you rearrange this expression then you can clearly see that we can write it as the exponential of like this constant in front times the exponential of um, k times log q plus n minus k times log min minus q. Now we can collect all the terms that involve k and get the exponential of k times the logarithm of q over 1 minus q plus an expression that doesn't involve k, n times log 1 minus q. So this is of the form that we're looking for and now we just have to rename the variables to see that this is an exponential family. This term here in front which only depends on k and not on q, notice again that we've decided to treat n as a fixed number is uh, the base measure, so it's h of k and the term in here is, this is the, the sort of mixing term between k and the parameters, so the sufficient statistics of the Bernoulli distribution is literally just k and the natural parameters of this distribution is given by this, it's called the logit function, the logarithm of q over 1 minus q plus this normalization constant minus the logarithm of z of w is given by um, n times the logarithm of 1 minus q. So there is no w in here, it's still written in q. If you rewrite it in terms of what we just decided w is, then this function can be written in this form. It's n times the logarithm of 1 plus e to the w. So maybe a first observation you have here is that we've decided to say that n is a fixed number. This is similar to how we've said in the Gaussian case that the dimensionality of the problem, d, is a fixed number and we're not considering it a parameter. Of course there are settings in which you can question whether this is the right thing to do or not. And that will then have an effect on what exactly you get to call the sufficient statistics and the base measure and the natural parameters. This is a first example of how the definition of exponential families is often a little bit vague and depends a bit on interpretation. But we'll see that that's not really a problem because what we're going to do with these distributions doesn't really depend on these technicalities. So here's another example we used as a conjugate prior for this Bernoulli distribution, the beta distribution. The beta distribution is given by this distribution over the variable we just called q on the previous slide with two parameters alpha and beta and it has this form. So we use this because it's a conjugate prior for the Bernoulli distribution which actually is also, also contains terms of the form q to the k times 1 minus q to some other parameter. 
Now here we thought about this object as a function of k, so it's a probability distribution over k with parameters q. Now we're looking for a probability distribution over q, so that needs a different normalization constant, that's called the beta integral. Again, we can rewrite this expression by um, just writing it as the exponential of, there's just a one in front, times the exponential of the logarithm of q times alpha minus one, plus the logarithm of one minus q times beta minus one, minus the logarithm of the beta integral. So this is one way of defining this as an exponential family with a base measure of one, a sufficient statistics that's given by log of q and log of one minus q, and natural parameters that are given by alpha minus one and beta minus one. Notice though that we could also take these ones outside and um, treat them as like to give additional terms involving log of q and log of one minus q. So we could drag those outside of the integral. And then this would be an equivalent definition in which the base measure is ha happens to be one over q times one minus q and the natural parameters are given by um, well alpha and beta. So again, here's an example of how the definition of what exactly an exponential family is depends on how you want to write these expressions. So one thing you have to keep in mind when dealing with exponential families, that there is no unique way of writing a particular probability distribution, at least in general, in exponential family form. There are though a whole list of interesting such exponential families which can be used for various different applications. Here are just a few of them. You can find an even longer list on Wikipedia if you like. For example, there is the Bernoulli distribution we've just encountered which is a distribution over probabilities for um, uh, the individual successes of coin tosses or observations of uh, people wearing glasses or not or other individual discrete events in, as observations. There's the Poisson distribution, which is a probability distribution over the number of events happening in a certain time frame, given that they are happening independently with a certain frequency in that time. For example, how many emails you get per day, given that the rate at which you get emails is constant. There's the Laplace distribution, which is the exponential of uh, absolute distance. That's a distribution that's often used for extreme events, for uh, disasters in nature like floods and so on. There's the, um, well, the frequently called chi-square distribution, but it's a bit annoying to have a, a, just a parameter. So here I'm listing a bunch of people that could be connected to this name. Uh, the Helmert distribution, Helmert being a German geodesic, so it's, uh, someone who works in the measurement of Earth, which is a, um, a distribution over variance. This is actually a special case of the gamma distribution we already encountered. There's the Dirichlet distribution, which we already saw, a probability distribution over probabilities for multivariate class events. So it's the conjugate prior to discrete distributions. So this, this distributions over individual events coming from more than two classes. That's the gamma distribution, which is connected maybe to Euler or to Bernoulli, as we saw. Now I'm putting down Euler's name just to be fair, which is maybe a generalization of the chi-square distribution as a good conjugate prior for variances of Gaussian distributions. The Vichar distribution, which is a multivariate version of the gamma and is widely used as a conjugate prior for covariances, for example, to model stock indices over time and their covariances as they develop. The Gaussian distribution, which we've already seen and got to know and love, which is our prior for functions, for supervised machine learning problems, and there's generalizations of them, we're going to encounter Boltzmann in a, in a moment. From this list and from the example applications on the right hand side, you can maybe already guess what kind of role exponential families might need to play or should play in your mental toolbox. They offer data types in the probabilistic concept or context. If you're a computer scientist, then you know and sort of intuitively use the concept of data types like integers and floats and arrays and lists and so on. These are types of objects that are particularly suitable for certain kinds of operations and they come with, they come with certain interfaces that um, allow you to apply them in a particularly clean way to particular problems. And sometimes they overlap in their use cases. So floats and integers are actually conceptually separate from each other, but some people don't care so much and they use them sort of in an overlapping fashion, which is maybe not particularly clean. 
Exponential families play a similar kind of role. They, they um, are particularly suited to certain types of variables, but in a somewhat more subtle kind of way. So if, you if, you're, if you're making observations of a variable, actually uh, if you're collecting data that is related to a latent variable of a certain type, then there's often a corresponding exponential family you might want to use if you know about it. If you want to know the scale of a Gaussian distribution, you better use a chi-square or gamma or Vichar distribution for it, depending on the dimensionality and the number of observations. If you want to learn a real-valued variable, then you use a Gaussian. If you want to learn discrete probabilities, you use a Dirichlet prior and so on and so on. Now I've said several times that exponential family distributions have great properties and that you want to know and use them, but I haven't actually shown you sort of in a formal way the great properties of these exponential families. We've only hinted at, that, at them so far. So let's go ahead and see some of the great properties of exponential families. And advanced warning, what I'm going to show you in the next few minutes are actually overlapping concepts that relate to each other. So there are different ways of looking at essentially the same algebraic properties of exponential families. And I nevertheless think that it's a good idea to do it in this fashion rather than to give you the most general introduction to the most high level discussion of their properties first because it's easier to understand this way. The first great property of exponential family distributions is that they have conjugate priors and that these conjugate priors actually are themselves exponential family distributions. To see that, let's consider a generic exponential family, pri uh, exponential family distribution, like this one. So let's say we're getting to see data x, which we assume to come from this kind of likelihood function, from this dis from distribution conditional on some unknown variable w, and we want to do inference on w. So we need a conjugate prior for it, and it has exponential family form. Then what we can do is essentially, in an abstract fashion, repeat the process we did at the beginning of the lecture with these individual concrete instantiations of exponential family distributions to see that there is a conjugate prior and it is actually itself an exponential family. And to do that, I can just show you what that conjugate prior is. It's this probability distribution, which has a normalization constant, which is defined naturally from the structure. So it's, the, it's an exponential family with sufficient statistics that are given by W and the negative log normalization constant of Z. Natural parameters that we just add to them, so that's just giving a name to things, and then a new normalization constant. So notice that we need two things here. We need to know two things. We need to actually know what the log normalization constant of our exponential family is. If we don't know it, then we can't really write this expression in this form. It's just then a very abstract thing. So knowing the normalization constant of exponential family distributions is extremely crucial. And we will see that over and over and over again in the next few minutes. And then to do anything interesting with this, we actually also need to know what the log normalization constant of our conjugate prior is. So we need to know what this integral is. And of course, we only know whether we know that once we know what the explicit forms of log of z of w and, um, well, w itself actually is. If we have such a prior, let's just convince ourselves that it is actually conjugate. So if we multiply this likelihood with this prior, then, um, and let's say we have many terms of that form, so we get lots of different observations, xi, because that's the most general form, then the posterior distribution is going to be the product of prior and likelihood up to normalization. We'll get to see the normalization in a moment. And clearly, this is of the form, there's a bunch of terms in x, which, are, which arrive from the base measure, and notice that those don't matter, they will just drop out in the normalization constant. This is one of the reasons why the base measure is often considered as kind of a secondary object that's not so important in exponential family distributions. Not only can it be absorbed into the, the sufficient statistics, it also doesn't really matter for the conjugacy property, because um, a term in x here will not um, affect our posterior on w. The only terms that matter are these expressions in W here and here and here and here. And we notice that the posterior is going to be of the form of the prior where the sufficient statistics are updated in an interesting fashion. Uh, sorry, the natural parameters are updated in an interesting fashion. To get the posterior natural parameters, we take the prior natural parameters and then add the sufficient statistics of the likelihood. And the second sort of special natural parameter that is related to the log normalization constant, so there's a, it's a scalar term obviously because there's only one log normalization constant, that thing actually just keeps track of how many observations we've seen, how many terms we have in our likelihood. 
just counts up the number of experiments. We've seen instantiations of this before in the case of beta and Dirichlet and also gamma inference and actually it's also hidden inside of Gaussian inference even though we didn't see it so explicitly. Maybe we'll make that an exercise to see that. Now Bayesian inference doesn't just require multiplying a prior and a likelihood, it also requires computing an evidence, the normalization term of a posterior like this. Now this we can compute because it actually amounts to a normalization constant of such an exponential family distribution. So let's say we only think about one particular sample, x, so we don't have n observations, we just have one, then to predict that sample, to compute the evidence for that observation, we need to compute this marginal probability distribution. And if we now plug in the forms for this, so if we plug in the form of our exponential family likelihood, and we plug in the form of our conjugate prior, then we see that we have to compute an integral over an expression that is exactly given by an evaluation of the normalization constant of the conjugate prior at a point that is sort of an, the predicted update to the, um, to the sufficient statistics. So the, uh, or the, sorry, the natural parameters, I keep mixing them up. So we need to compute this capital F at alpha plus the value of the sufficient statistics as x and nu plus one. And that's only two up to normalization. There's a bug in this equation. There should be a minus here. Sorry about that. Just by the definition of the conjugate prior, of course. Then that walks, um, moves down here. And um, we just have to evaluate this ratio to get our predictive distribution. That is up to the base measure h of x, but of course we assume that we know what the base measure is so we can just evaluate it. Here's another reason for why base measures are not that important. We just assume that we can evaluate them, so if we can evaluate them, we just plug them in front. Now notice that again, to do, be able to do so, this requires that we know this log normalization constant, actually this normalization constant. If we don't know this, then we can't do this kind of process. So actually, I could have defined a little bit more specifically, practically minded, an exponential family by saying exponential, exponential family distributions are distributions that are, that are of that form where you know all of the quantities in there. So it's not enough to just be able to abstractly write down that there is this thing. If you actually want to use it, you need to know what not just phi and h, but also what log of z of w is. And in fact, it turns out that z is really important. Many of the great applications that I'm going to show you, I already showed you and I'm going to show you now, we rely on the fact that you know what z is. Actually, a very concise way of thinking about what exponential family inference actually means is that you're borrowing someone else's work to compute an integral. If someone has already gone ahead and computed z of w for you for a particular choice of natural parameters and sufficient statistics, then you can use that work of someone else, the embodied knowledge in that, in that integral, to simplify subsequent computations. You already saw that in this example. So if you have this f, then you can predict future x or you can compute evidences if you like. And um, you can also compute posteriors because posteriors involve this normalization constant. Another, another way of thinking about this role of f is in the next slide. So let's say we, want, we have data that comes from an exponential family, but we don't have a prior, a conjugate prior. So maybe, um, so I mean, this slide is sort of a, the, the generic setting of what we'd like to do, Bayesian inference on um, a, param, a, a variable w. But um, we notice that we, to be able to do so, we need this normalization constant f. So actually we need two different normalization constant, z and f. So let's say we don't have f, but we have z. So that's already one integral that may, might simplify our lives. Then we can still do approximate inference in the maximum likelihood sense on the parameters w and use the structure of the exponential family to simplify our life. And to see that, let's say we get data x that comes from uh, the, uh, uh, an exponential family with parameters w, so it has this form. Now you'll notice that I've left out the base measure here. I've just assumed that the base measure is one. You can see from what I'm going to do in the next few slides that that, that, does, that, that doesn't really matter. If you have a, a base measure h of x here, it's just going to drop out uh, one line below. So if you have such data and we'd now like to know what w is, then ideally we'd like to do conjugate prior inference. That requires knowing this f, this normalization constant of the conjugate prior. 
If you don't know that, maybe we can do maximum likelihood inference. We can at least estimate what the best choice of W would be and then ask, give that as a point estimate. To do so, we could try and maximize this expression, this one here, um, for our n data points. Of course, if you only have one datum, then nothing changes, right? It's just, you just get rid of this sum. Now, we've done this exercise many times before, so by now you probably know what we need to do. We need to take the logarithm of this expression because we only want the maximum, so we might as well compute the maximum of the logarithm of this expression because the logarithm is a monotonic transformation. That makes things easier, so we can just compute the maximum of this expression inside of the exponential of our exponential family. And then what we're going to do is we're going to compute the gradient of this expression with respect to w and set it to zero. Now, because there is this sum in the exponential family, setting this gradient to zero means that we just need the gradient of this expression, which is our log normalization constant with respect to w, to be equal to the sufficient statistics or actually this kind of empirical estimate of their expected value. So why is that good? Well, it's good for two reasons. The first one is if we know, uh, so first of all, there are uh, sufficient statistics in here. So even if we have n data points, then we know that at most what we need to compute here, this whole gradient that we care about, just involves summing up the sufficient statistics of each datum. Now, there are finitely many of these sufficient statistics, so we know that this process is of linear cost in the number of data points. That's already useful because it means we don't have to do something more complicated with the data and we will have linear time cost in uh, this maximum likelihood inference in the number of data points. And then what we need to compute um, to actually solve this equation is the gradient of this log normalization constant with respect to W. So that means we need to know what Z is, of course, otherwise we can't compute this gradient. At least we need to know it in a sort of numerical sense. We need to have code that can be automatically differentiated that computes this log z of w. Now, in some cases, this log gra uh, gradient of the log normalization constant is of such a form that we can just solve this equation in closed form. Then you have, you have a particularly fast way of doing maximum likelihood inference. If that's not the case, then we can still compute the gradient and use it in a numerical optimization scheme to compute estimates of our w. That's a little bit more expensive, but we still know that it's going to be linear in the number of data points because it involves the data only through the sufficient statistics. Actually, another great property of, of uh, exponential family distributions is already hinted at in this uh, expression that you see down here. So the gradient of the log normalization constant is related to this empirical estimate of what looks like an expected value or sort of a Monte Carlo estimate, if you like, of the expected value of the sufficient statistics. Let's make that formally a bit more precise because it is actually true that the log gradient is equal to an expected value of the sufficient statistics. So let's say we have a, a not data from, but actually a, an exponential family distribution, P of x given w, so a distribution that is of the form as we have it on the previous slide. Then if you take the derivative of this expression, um, so first of all, if you compute the integral over this thing over x, then that's just one because it's a probability distribution over x, right, by assumption, which is, or by assumption or by definition of what log z of w is. Then that means if you can take the gradient of this expression, which is one, so the gradient of something that's one is zero, then um, we can take the gradient inside, assuming everything is sufficiently regular, which it usually is, then um, if we, that means we need to take the derivative of this exponential, so here's an exponential in here, to maybe let's make, go back one slide, we need to take the derivative of the exponential of this expression with respect to w, that means we are by chain rule, of course, going to get that expression back times the inner derivative. So the inner derivative of this is phi with respect to w is the derivative, right? It's phi minus the gradient of log of z of w. So let's do that here. Um, and uh, so p remains because it, that's the exponential. Then our uh, integral over this gradient turns into this expression. There is an expression here with the gradient of log of z of w, which doesn't depend on x by definition. So it can move outside of the integral. This here is still one because it's still an, an integral over a probability distribution. Here, we get the expected value of phi of x, and therefore what we've just seen is, because this expression is zero, so we can rearrange, that the expected value of the sufficient statistics under this exponential family distribution is 
given by the gradient of the log of z of w. So if you have something for which you assume it is exponential family distributed, then you can compute expected values of the sufficient statistics, and often these sufficient statistics are sort of interesting for various reasons, very directly by computing the gradient of the log normalization constant. This is another instance of, or another sort of symptom of, the, of what I summarized before as exponential families being a way to leverage someone else's integration work. So if someone has previously computed or told you what log of z of w is, then we can now compute expected values of the sufficient statistics of this exponential family distribution, not by computing an integral, which as you know is an expensive complicated process, but instead just by taking the derivative of this log normalization constant. So for example, you, to compute the expected value of the log probabilities under a Dirichlet distribution, log probabilities being sufficient statistics of the Dirichlet distribution, we can do so by leveraging Dirichlet's or actually maybe Euler's and Bernoulli's work on the beta integral by computing gradients of that um, gamma or beta function rather than writing down an abstract integral that we then have to solve in a complicated high dimensional potentially uh, numerical fashion. A final thing I just want to point out in passing, which doesn't seem to particularly important yet, but um, is going to be helpful a few lectures from now, is just the sort of abstract form of fact that if you take the product of two uh, exponential family distributions over the same random variable, but with different parameters, so that's sort of the other way around from the way we've used it before, then you only, to, that, that gives another exponential family distribution in which you just have to add the sufficient statistics. This is going to be useful when we do approximate inference in a framework of um, exponential family distributions because of course this is an operation that is very easy to implement on a computer. It's just summing floating point numbers. So to summarize what we've seen in these last few minutes is that exponential family distributions have great properties. They have conjugate priors. The only problem is that their conjugate prior involves a log normalization constant which you might not always know. But that conjugate prior is itself at least an exponential family. So that's maybe interesting. More concretely, something we definitely can do once we have an exponential family distribution is maximum likelihood inference on the parameters because that can be done by computing the gradient of the log normalization constant and setting it equal to the empirical estimator, so the expected the Monte Carlo estimator of the expected value of the sufficient statistics. That's relevant because there are finitely many sufficient statistics. So if you have many data points, then that means that inference on the sufficient statistics, uh, sorry, inference on the natural parameters, maximum likelihood type inference, is feasible in linear time. And as a related result, we saw that we're able to compute integrals over um, the sufficient statistics, so expected values of sufficient statistics, not by computing an integral, but by just computing a gradient. So all of these properties require us to know what the log normalization constant or the normalization constant actually is. Otherwise, we can't really make use of, of, of these properties. So exponential family distributions are particularly interesting if you know their log normalization constant. In fact, one could do the entire kind of argument the other way around and say, if you know how to do a particular integral that involves an exponential function, so the exponential of something, then that directly defines an exponential family distribution. So exponential families are a way to turning to, uh, of, of turning an analytic integral into a probability distribution with good estimation properties. A distribution with which we can do maximum likelihood inference under which we can compute expected values of the sufficient statistics and so on and so on. So before we continue on with the grand finale of this lecture, let me summarize or recap what we've done so far in this lecture that took a relatively phenomenological approach to this somewhat technical domain of exponential families. So we began by observing quite concretely in practice that for certain probability distributions, it's possible to learn parameters of that distribution, latent quantities in these distributions 
through in a Bayesian fashion through a conjugate prior. That is true, for example, for the parameters of discrete distributions and binary distributions, or for the mean of a Gaussian or the variance of a Gaussian. So when we try to formalize this notion of a conjugate prior, we notice that there is this other concept called an exponential family which simplifies the constructions of conjugate priors. And in fact, if we choose the likelihood to be of exponential family form, then first of all, there is actually a conjugate prior and that conjugate prior is itself of exponential family form. Now that conjugate prior, if it's available, that means if it's tractable, allows Bayesian inference on the parameters of our probability distribution. Now it's not always tractable, so if it's not tractable, then we can still do maximum likelihood inference on the parameters of our exponential family likelihood. And doing so is possible in linear time in the number of data points drawn from this exponential family distribution because the data only enter in the sufficient statistics of our distribution. So maybe you've noticed that the process that we've gone through here has something to do with learning. We're learning not a function as we have in previous settings, but we're essentially learning a probability distribution. We keep getting lots of draws, x, from some unknown probability distribution, and then we use those draws to fit the distribution, to learn probability distributions. Can we make this process a bit more formal? Do exponential families provide a framework for learning probability distributions similar to how Gaussians provide a framework for learning functions? And to do so, let's maybe go back to our framework for learning functions and think about how it would be described in a statistical and probabilistic framework and how they two connect to each other. So, in lectures so far, we focused on learning problems where we're trying to learn functions. So that's supervised machine learning, if you like. In the first lecture on Gaussian, it's actually the very first lecture on Gaussians, I provided you with a, like a tedious, lengthy version of um, what I just did with exponential families. We went through various good properties of Gaussian distributions, just as we now just went through good properties of exponential family distributions. Then, in the lecture that introduced regression on Gaussian distributions, sorry, a regression on functions, we decided to use a combination of likelihood and structure in the thing we're trying to learn, the parameterized structure, the function. We decided that the likelihood is going to be a Gaussian probability distribution. So we get to see values, or oh, there's a bracket missing here, values of an unknown function evaluated at various locations with Gaussian noise. And then we made a further simplification to assume that the function we're trying to learn is actually of a parametric form, so that it can be written with a bunch of features. Then we noticed back then actually that there was a conjugate prior for the weights of this, uh, of, of this function under this Gaussian likelihood, and that conjugate prior happened to be a Gaussian probability distribution. We didn't always call it a conjugate prior back then, but that's what it is, because it gives a posterior over W that is itself a Gaussian distribution. And then we use that framework to learn functions. Now, you can do a statistical analysis of this kind of process, of this Bayesian inference process, and identify it with a certain risk minimization procedure. We've done that on previous lectures. Here's a quick recap. If you're computing the posterior distribution over these unknown weights W, then um, you're multiplying prior and likelihood and dividing by the evidence. If you think only of the maximum of this distribution, that is a point estimate, then you can in, uh, equivalently compute the maximum of the negative of the logarithm of this posterior. That simplifies expressions and we saw that if we use a Gaussian prior and a Gaussian likelihood, that means this loss function, this empirical risk that we are here minimizing when we are finding the maximum of the posterior distribution corresponds to this expression, which is a sum over quadratic terms. This is the log likelihood and a um, quadratic regularizer on the weights. That's the log Gaussian prior. And here I've rearranged already terms so that the variance of the, of the likelihood is moved over into the, uh, the prior. Now, such an analysis, what a statistical analysis now might include, among other things, is 
uh, looking at what, what, how this estimate behaves if you now get lots and lots and lots of data points. So if you have many data points, so then um, and let's assume these data points xi come from some um, probability distribution p, then, and we, let's even for a simplicity assume that we actually get to see the, the, this, um, this function value without noise. If you have it with noise, we have to think a little bit more, but actually things don't really complicate that themselves all that much. Then the loss function that we are um, minimizing here is actually the expected square distance between the true function and our approximation for it. Now notice that that's actually the true function. This is not f as written in this parametric form, it's just a real f. So we just decided to represent f in this particular form. And then we have this regularizer, but if you have a large number of data points, then this regularizer basically is drowned out in some sense. You can imagine that as n gets large, this term here sort of drops away, and the function we're going to find is the function, or is the choice of w, which within a hypothesis class of function values of uh, functions that can be written in this parametric form, minimizes this expected quadratic risk. Now, in this lecture, we moved away from functions to probability distributions, to generative models for data. Is there a corresponding concept for what we've just done with exponential family distributions and do exponential family distributions play a similar role to parametric Gaussian regression when we do maximum likelihood inference in exponential family models or actually full conjugate prior Bayesian inference? And the answer is yes. And the, the technical answer is yes and it relates to a change of the empirical risk from this quadratic loss to what you might call a log loss. And that log loss is connected with the name of these two American statisticians who have two of the most mispronounced and misspelled names in statistics. They're called Solomon Kuhlbach and Richard Leibler. Or at least that's the German pronunciation, but these are American guys. So Kuhlbach or Liebler or Leibler is probably okay as well. They were uh, statisticians who worked for uh, various secret agencies in the US during the Second World War and the Cold War on cryptoanalysis. And their name is connected to this particular function, which is called a divergence. It's the kuhlberg leibler divergence, or KL divergence, which is a measure of dissimilarity, and I'm particularly careful not to say a metric or a distance measure, it's a sort of measure of dissimilarity between two probability distributions, p and q, which is given by this expression. So assuming that p has a density and q has a density given by little p and little q, then we can write this expression, take the logarithm uh, of, over their ratio and integrate against p. A few interesting properties to note, which I'm not going to prove for time, is that this is not a symmetric expression. So if you exchange p and q, that's a different thing because the integral is then not against uh, p anymore, but against q. So it's quite a different object actually. Secondly, um, this is an expression that is not a metric. So it doesn't fulfill the triangle inequality, for example. However, it does have the property that it is strictly, uh, or actually not strictly, that it is um, non-negative. So its values is always larger or equal than zero. And it's actually zero if and only if P and Q are exactly identical um, almost everywhere. So everywhere except for a set of measure zero. This thing is going to provide our loss, which we're going to minimize when we are doing maximum likelihood inference with exponential families. Now let's see that that's actually true. So notice that this is here and this expression, before we move on, is similar to this expression in that there's an integral over p here, there's an integral over p here, but inside of the integral, we don't have the square distance between the function p and the function q, but we have the difference between their logarithms. That's clearly asymmetrical as well, right? It's the logarithm of p minus the logarithm of q integrated against p, rather than the square of the distance between p and q. Now let's see how that loss function shows up when we're doing inference with exponential families. So let's say that we get some data x. This x is actually drawn from some unknown probability distribution p of x. We don't know what that distribution is, but we'll make the decision to assume, to approximate it with a parameterized uh, probability distribution. So 
with an exponential family distribution. So we assume that the true p, which we don't know, can be written in the form of p hat over x, which is a function that has exponential family form with parameters w, normalization constant, and sufficient statistics phi. By the way, just to be clear again, because people can't keep getting this wrong, this is called an exponential family. It's not the fact that the set of all functions that can be written in this form is the exponential family. It's that every family of functions that can be written in this form for a fixed phi and various w, that's an exponential family. So we want to approximate it this way, right? So we have our data, we don't know what the distribution is, but we assume that it can be written in this form. Now, let's just decide that we want to find the choice of W which minimizes the KL divergence between the true distribution P and the approximate distribution P hat. So from the previous slide, we know that that KL divergence can be written in this form. I literally just copied over uh, the definition of the kuberg lambda divergence. So if we wanted to find the W which minimizes this expression, then we can take the derivative of this expression with respect to W. But to do so, let's first simplify a little bit. So here's a term that only involves P. This term actually happens to be the negative entropy of P. That's just what it's called. Um, and it doesn't matter to us because it doesn't depend on W. So if we optimize for W, we might, we might as well forget about it. So instead, we just get the term, um, the second term in this expression, which is an expected value because it's an integral over p over the logarithm of p, of p hat. So let's look at that logarithm. Well, it's given by phi, phi transpose times w minus the log of z. So the log of z, w, doesn't depend on x. So that integral here is trivial. It's just an integral over a probability distribution. So it's just that thing. And in front, we have the expected value under the true distribution p of the sufficient statistics and they're in a product with respect to w. So if you want to minimize this, then we have an expression that we've seen before. We want to choose w such that the gradient of um, this expression is equal to this expected value. And so here we go, right? And one way to estimate that is, so, and that's the empirical risk minimizer, is to just compute the empirical risk. So that's the empirical estimate of the, um, of the, the sufficient statistics transposed with W minus the log of, of, of Z. And if you take the gradient of that, then we find an empirical risk minimizer, which is given by the choice of W, which sets these two equal to each other. In the limit of many, many data points, of course, um, this um, Monte Carlo estimate here, if assuming we have IID data, converges to the, the true expected value, and then we're actually just finding the member of our, of our exponential family, the choice of W, which minimizes the KL divergence between the true distribution P and the estimated distribution P hat. So that's, if you like, statistical estimation of probability distributions. Now, this, is, this lecture is called probabilistic machine learning, so we would like to not do statistical estimation. We'd like to do probabilistic estimation. So let's fix that by adding, by moving towards the full Bayesian framework, and we already have all the ingredients for it from previous parts of this lecture. So first of all, let's say that we didn't want to do maximum likelihood estimate because, estimates, because maybe we only have three data points by 20 sufficient statistics. Then um, we are going to introduce a, a prior distribution over the parameters of our exponential family W. So we already know how to do that. We know that there is a conjugate prior for this exponential family, and it, it, it has a form that we had on previous slides. So it's of the form alpha times um, uh, W minus eta times log of Z of W plus normalization constant, which only depends on alpha and eta, or alpha and nu, sorry. Now, that normalization constant is the really tricky part. So that's why, so far, we're not doing full Bayesian inference yet. But if we want to do map estimation, so if we just want the maximum of the posteriori distribution, then we don't need that normalizer because it doesn't depend on the value of w. It only depends on the value of the prior parameter, alpha and nu. So all we need to do to maximize the posterior distribution is we take the, um, 
the logarithm of the full posterior. So the full posterior is the a, a, a p of w of that exponential family form for us. I mean, actually, it could be of any form, but we're going to need exponential family form in a moment for full Bayesian inference times the likelihood. So the likelihood is given by our exponential family. And um, in the logarithm, that just means we add that, that this exp exponential family internal sort of form of the prior. And everything just sort of moves through as before, right? So uh, the same arguments go as before. So this is still, a, still an entropy. So it still doesn't depend on W. We get rid of it. Um, here are the expressions we had on the previous slide. And now there are just two additional ex expressions that involve W um, here and there. If we take their gradient, the whole gradient of this expression and set it to zero, then we get a new mean, uh, sorry, map estimate. It's now a map estimate rather than a maximum likelihood estimate. And um, if you wanted to do so, then uh, you, can, you can convince yourself that that has a minimum that is given by uh, at the point where the, this uh, estimate or the true expected value of the sufficient statistics, actually, the, the, sorry, the estimate of the sufficient statistics is equal to this sort of regularized expression. So this is an expression that involves the term we had before, but now corrected for the number of data points. So, as n gets large, the prior again drops out. So our parameter alpha doesn't matter anymore because 1 over n goes to 0. While the, um, the term that we had in the maximum likelihood estimate is still around. And these two n's approximately cancel for large values. And we're back at the maximum likelihood estimate. That's sort of a typical statistical estimation uh, result that as the number of data points grows very large, our map estimate approaches the maximum likelihood estimate, the prior gets drowned out by the data, and again, we get an estimate, a point estimate, that is approximately or asymptotically equal to the maximum likelihood estimate, and therefore minimizes the KL divergence. So let's see what happens if you do the full Bayesian inference. So what we would like to do is to find a conjugate prior for our exponential family distribution. If we can find that, and it will look like this, then, I mean, finding that depends on knowing what f is. That's the entire trick, right? So if uh, we, know, we know that the conjugate prior will have to have this form just by construction from looking at the likelihood, um, then, then to be able to normalize that, we need to know what this integrand is. So uh, let's say we know what this log normalization uh, function f is, then we uh, can use it to do full Bayesian inference on a probability distribution of exponential family form. So we're going to compute our posterior. That means we multiply the prior with the likelihoods. They're actually multiple terms because we assume that we have n data points and normalize. We saw that we can do this normalization because it involves just evaluating this partition function f at various points. And we'll get a posterior over w that is in the exponential family, in the, the conjugate prior exponential family, with updated parameters that are given by the prior parameters plus the, the, the sum over the sufficient statistics of the data and a count variable that keeps track of how many observations we've made. Now, oh, that's actually full Bayesian inference. And if you only care about Bayesian inference, then you are done at this point. You can use exponential families to learn probability distributions. And to be able to do so, you need to know two things. You need to know the exponential family itself that you are trying to learn, including its normalization constant. And you need to know the normalization constant of the conjugate prior. There is only like, like up to isomorphism at, at one conjugate prior. And um, to, to be able to use it, you need to know what that normalization constant is. Now, you can do Bayesian inference with that, but you might also be interested in what the corresponding connection now is to the statistical viewpoint in this framework. And it is, again, connected to cool black ladder divergence. So if we keep making such observations, so if n grows large, then we can have a look at the behavior of the posterior distribution around its mode, around the map estimate. We already know from the previous slide that this map estimate converges towards the maximum likelihood estimate. I'll leave it as an exercise for you to convince yourself that the Hessian, the curvature of this um, log post, oh, sorry, of this posterior distribution, of this uh, exponential parameter distribution, is given by this expression at the mode. So um, yeah, I'll just leave that to you. And what you'll see here is that this 
uh, second derivative, this Hessian, is given by the value of the, of the posterior at its mode, so that's a large positive value, or it's the largest possible positive value, times um, some uh, particular value, some constant at, at this, so that's the curvature at, uh, of the log normalization constant at this particular point. That curvature has to be positive because the, um, actually has to be uh, negative because, because we are at the mode. So this is, this is here a, um, um, a maximum. So this has to have negative curvature, right? There's a minus here in front. And in the important bit is that, it is that there's this new here. So that's the parameter of this um, exponential family probability distribution that goes in front of our normalization constant. Now, as the number of data points increases, this parameter is nu plus n from over here, and n gets large, so the curvature gets very large. That means that our posterior distribution is concentrating around its mode. Of course, that's not a full proof because it's only a local statement, but it has to suffice for this argument. Now, in the limit of infinitely many data points, you can then th thus convince yourself that the probability distribution, the pos full posterior distribution, concentrates around its maximum likelihood value and not just, well, maximum a posteriori, but we know from the previous slide that it goes to the maximum likelihood value and we already know what that maximum likelihood value is. It's the expected value under the true, true distribution P, not the approximate one of the sufficient statistics. So what our um, probability distribution is going to do, what our Bayesian inference framework is going to do is that it will as the number of data points increases, find an estimate and concentrate the posterior around it, which is given by the choice of W, which minimizes the KL divergence between the true distribution and the expected, uh, the, the approximate distribution. So with that, let's briefly summarize, exponential families actually provide an entire framework for learning probability distributions. You can use them in a maximum likelihood, maximum a posteriori, or full Bayesian framework, depending on how many quantities you have available, how many integrals you are able to solve. Given data drawn IRD from some unknown distribution P, if you decide to approximate that distribution with an exponential family distribution, then the, um, you can do maximum likelihood inference in O of n time by computing gradients, and that involves computing sufficient statistics over the n data points. You can assign a prior which always exists, it's, it's called the conjugate prior. It's not usually tractable in general, but um, if it's not tractable, then you can still do maximum a posteriori inference. And if it is tractable, you can do full Bayesian inference. Whichever of these three, three frameworks you use in the limit of arbitrarily many data points, asymptotically, this posterior distribution or this likelihood distribution will concentrate around a point estimate which is given by the choice of W which minimizes the KL divergence, so if you like the expected log empirical risk between the approximate distribution, the exponential family distribution, and the, um, the true generating distribution. So the reason I've gone through this exercise of showing you this perhaps somewhat technical notion of exponential families is that I want to empower you and maybe take away the respect you have for these, this somewhat short and very specific list of probability distributions that you might find online and which is associated with these big names, the Gaussian distribution, the Dirichlet distribution, the gamma and chi-square distribution. Sometimes they don't even have the names of people attached but only abstract magical symbols to them. And that might give you the impression that there is only a very finite list of these distributions and that you don't even have to think beyond them. The goal of this lecture course in general is to empower you to build your own tools. And that means you shouldn't be using black boxes, whether these black boxes are come to you in the form of software libraries or in the form of some formula that some big guy wrote down a long time ago. So let's end this lecture with a little bit not entirely serious kind of uh, game. Let's say I wanted to, I just really wanted to be part of this list of cool people and I would like to add my face to this uh, gallery of, uh, of wonderful, amazing mathematicians then maybe all I have to do is to invent an exponential family probability distribution and somehow sneak my name onto it on Wikipedia. So let's see how I would do that. Well, 
um, I've, the, the, the one thing we actually need to define an exponential family distribution is a log normalization constant. If we have that, then we have everything because its gradient defines the expected value of the sufficient statistics and we can do inference, at least maximum likelihood inference with it. So what I did is I opened up a big book of, with a table of integrals and I looked at the integrals that are integrals over exponential functions. You can find that list on Wikipedia, you can find big books in the library and maybe go a little bit deeper into the books and find some obscure integral. I've chosen, I've actually found one which is of this form. So I know that the integral from 0 to infinity over the exponential of um, minus w1 x squared minus w2 over x over x squared the x is given by a constant, it's given by the square root of, of pi over, two, over w1 times the exponential of minus 2 times w1, w2. So that's exactly the kind of thing we need. That's a normalization constant of an exponential family distribution. And all that's left to do is a little bit of PR work. So we need to come up with some data set. Um, and that data set, of course, has to be motivated by the shape of this distribution. So if we vary w up and down, w1, w2, then um, this actually amounts to uh, creating a family of distributions that looks like these red uh, curves here. So if you, uh, you can sort of think for yourself what happens, how, what the relationship between W1 and W2 is, maybe you can invent a name for them actually for yourself, maybe that might be a good exercise to think about the shape of this distribution. And then if you have that, then um, you're, you're done, right? You can now do inference on data sets that look like this, of course, you have to come up with a reason for why that is a good, a, good, uh, a good good data set or a kind of good structure to look at, but you know, maybe you can invent some. So for example, I could say, okay, the sufficient statistics of this uh, probability distribution are given by uh, minus x square and minus one over x square. So maybe it has something to do with the eigenvalues of symplectic matrices or, um, the, and therefore the stability of some uh, control problems. Maybe it has something to do with data that lies on a torus through which we have made a cut at some point, something like this. It doesn't really matter, right? We've just sort of, let's first invent the probability distribution and then let's see whether there's a use for it. So um, the, I've, I've just here written down the integral again. So this is something I actually found in a book. That's the hard bit, which I basically in doing so, um, let's say I took it on loan from someone who did this integral for me. It's actually some Russian mathematician from a long time ago, right? I just now know what this is. Now that, Z treated as the normalization constant of the exponential family defined by this form directly gives me everything I need. That's done, right? I don't actually have to contribute anything myself other than maybe coming up with a fancy abbreviation for this uh, data, for this probability distribution that somehow reminds people that I was the one who came up with it. So um, here it is just by definition again, what this probability distribution is. Here is the exponential family form and here is the log normalization constant, actually the normalization constant printed right in front of it. I don't know the normalization constant of the conjugate prior for this distribution because it's not, it, its normalization constant isn't in the table of integrals I looked at. So all I can possibly do is maximum likelihood type inference. So let me do that. To, to do maximum likelihood inference from a data set, I will collect data from, so here is on the right hand side is already a first datum that um, I've observed and there will be more in a moment and I will do maximum likelihood type inference. To do so I compute the, I, so let me just write down again what the normalization constant is and its logarithm. So that's what I have on the, on the whiteboard behind me. I've just taken the logarithm of it and all I now need to do is compute the gradient of this function with respect to its two parameters w1 and w2 that's given by this expression. That's a simple exercise you can do on a piece of paper and a few lines. To solve for the maximum likelihood estimate, I need to find, I need to compute the empirical uh, expected value of the sufficient statistics, so the empirical estimate of the expected value of the sufficient statistics that's given by this sum, and then solve this expression for these two parameters. Actually, it becomes kind of natural to introduce two new parameters, that's called a mu bar and omega bar, that makes it easy to uh, solve this, um, this equation. And um, we can just replace, like solve this linear equation, or sorry, not linear, this rational equation here for w1 and w2. And that's it. So now if you give me data, draws x, all I need to do is to take x, apply the square and one over the square of those, sum them up, and then plug in those numbers into this estimation procedure to get w1 and w2. 
And you can see here what this looks like. So after one datum, black is the true value, red is the estimate. The maximum likelihood estimate, of course, is overly confident because it's a maximum likelihood estimate. But as I get more data, uh, even after just three data points, I already have a pretty good estimate of the true distribution. And if I keep going like this, then they'll become more and more. And this distribution will approximate the true distribution. Of course, that's because I've assumed that the true distribution looks like the distribution I would like to use. If I would use a Gaussian distribution for, or actually some other distribution to draw my real numbers, then what this process would give me is the minimizer of the KL divergence between this family of distributions, this exponential family, and the uh, true distribution. With that, we're at the end of this lecture. Just to summarize again, exponential family distributions provide a tool set to learn probability distributions um, for, like, to, to learn basically generative models, right? To learn distributions over um, random variables from data. They, you can use them to do maximum likelihood inference. That's always possible once you have an exponential family, just by computing gradients of the log normalization constant and setting them equal to the sufficient statistics, or rather, their estimated values. That's possible in linear time. You can easily correct for a map estimate by introducing a conjugate prior. That conjugate prior is itself an exponential family distribution. If you happen to know the normalization constant of that exponential family conjugate prior, you can even do full Bayesian inference on probability distributions. And we saw a statistical interpretation of this process, which provides us with, which, with a guarantee that as the number of data points increases, we will at least find a best estimate for the um, true distribution within our parameterized family of exponential family distributions. The whole, like the linchpin of this entire process is knowing the log normalization constant. So if you find an integral somewhere in a table of integrals that allows you to compute expected values of some weird sufficient statistics, then you've just invented a new exponential family. Or maybe a little bit more realistically, if you have a data set that you think can be described, whose generative process can be described in terms of some sufficient statistics, maybe go out and see if you can find the corresponding integral in a table of exponential integrals. With that, we are at the end for today. Thank you very much for your time.